Hello, Fucandy here, and welcome back to another episode of Planet Zoo. And we're just admiring the little lemur's hair in their habitat. Oh, look at this one climbing the ladder. <laughs> I absolutely love just watching them bounce around. Super, super, super cute animals. And I hope you enjoyed the lemur habitat episode. So just to start off with today, I thought we'd give them some names and you guys have been coming up with some really good suggestions. So let's run down what we have got. So we have got a couple of babies already. Two little ones here. So firstly, we have got King Julian, who is our gold rated little baby boy. Excellent news. We've got a gold rated boy Lima. I'm absolutely loving that. That's exactly what we want. And King Julian was a suggestion by SK99 who suggested we name some of the lemurs after the characters in Madagascar, which I absolutely love. So obviously King Julian is the gold star rated baby there. We've also got Maurice and Mort. Now we've kind of got a lot, <laughs> a lot of female lemurs. So some of them are getting some male names here because <laughs> most of the suggestions happen to be male. But it is what it is. Uh, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm fine with that. So that was a great suggestion from SK99. Thank you so much for that. We've also got Lenny, uh, who was suggested, who's our alpha female, actually, who was suggested by both uh, Edward Bickford and DK. Thank you so much for your suggestions there. We then also have Leo, Leon, Leona, <laughs> who was also suggestions by DK as well, obviously using the L, as we did with the Nile monitors as well. Really love that. Thank you so much, DK, for that. And we've got Catherine who is our bronze rated lady here uh, and that is named from Demon Ace after your wife. <laughs> Thank you so much for that suggestion. I hope Catherine likes her Lima. And we have got a couple of others. We've got Mr. Lima the Seema <laughs> or Mr. Lima the Seymour. Is that how we say it? From Tom Host. Thank you so much for that as well. And Zabumafu. <laughs> is that how I say it? From Fused Obsidian. Thank you so much for all of those name suggestions. Absolutely love them. Keep them coming in for our next animal that we'll be placing later on in this episode. And I do have just one other one to mention, which was a Nile monitor. Let's go back to them. We had a couple of extra babies here, so I've given them some Nile names. But we did have a suggestion for Nile Rogers come in. <laughs> so we have now got Nile Rogers down here as well. A nice silver rated Nile monitor. And that was a suggestion from both actually Jay Murray and Arctic Fox suggested that almost at exactly the same time on different platforms. So thank you so much for that suggestion. Absolutely love that. Now there was one other little change that I have made since last time, which again was a suggestion from Edward Bickford, which was to add a little staff entrance into our food and drinks court over here, which absolutely makes sense. Now the staff do just jump over the front of their shops, but we could ignore that fact and we can add a little bit of realism here. So I've just plopped in a door with a staff only sign underneath it. Now, if you're looking for that in construction, if you go to the signs menu, there are standing signs, wall signs, but you can filter it to custom signs. And this is where you can place any sign which you can add text to. So in order to do that, let's just show you simply add this to a group. Obviously, we've got a line to surface, so it sticks in our wall there. We simply click on the sign. So we need to edit group, click on the sign, and then you can add your text here. So you can say whatever you want. Let's say that, hit enter, and then we've got it. And you can change the font and the color as you see fit there as well. So that's how you do the signage. And then just one little point about this little custom fake path here. Now these pieces are some of the best pieces in the game. You'll need the South America pack for this. Uh, but if we go to here, we search for temple. These temple pieces here, these painted ones, you can change the color of them to whatever you want. So here I've just changed them to a nice gray stone color which matches our little aquatic rocks again, which is one of the other best DLCs going. And we've just sunk them into the ground. So I've taken these and just literally sunk them in to make them look, and then designed them nicely, obviously, to make it look like a little stone path for the staff entrance there. So we didn't actually have to add in an actual piece of path because they're not going to walk on it anyway. It's purely decorative. So that's a little trick that you can do with that if you do have the South America pack. And again, if you are looking to pick up any of those DLCs, please do remember that you can use my instant gaming link, which is linked in the description below. It helps to support the channel. And not only that, they have unbelievably good discounts on all the Planet Zoo games at the moment and a whole host of other games as well. So do go and check that out. Now, before we get into this episode, I also have quite a really sad thing to announce. And that is that, unfortunately, while I was building the Lima Habitat, I took too long about it and Mary the Prairie passed on. <laughs> oh, I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm not laughing. It's very sad. Uh, so 
in our zoo tab there is a memorials tab and here you can see unfortunately the animals that have decided to die now this is kind of sad because she was only an adult she didn't even reach elder status but yeah mary the prairie unfortunately is no more and from here as well if we click on them we can create a memorial and i think because this is the first animal that has died in this zoo i definitely want to click to create a little memorial for this so i'm actually thinking maybe we put it up by their little cave over here there's a couple of them playing in here oh yes that's great to see so we can add this over here and we can it's just but acts like a sign essentially so we can just put that there and then you can see i mean it says shield and piazza or whatever that <laughs> means on the sign but if we click on it it is a memorial for mary the prairie oh goodness i'm so sad and do you know what she died 6th of october 2021 or year 21 it's now year 29 <laughs> i'm really sorry mary the prairie that i did not notice that you died eight years ago <laughs> oh, terrible zookeeping but anyway, that's how you add little memorial plaques. Um, and yeah, I think that's quite special. We've got Mary the Prairie there. But also to replace that as well, because I did absolutely love that name. I have, if we go into our black-tailed prairie dogs here, I have got a Mary the Prairie 2.0, <laughs> who's only two years old. So she's got quite a long time to live. We have got quite a few elders in here. So we're going to have to watch out for that because it is going to be, unfortunately, their time in not too long. So I need to spend slightly less time detailing and slightly more time engaging with our little animals before they clock it of old age. But that's the way it goes. That's how zookeeping is. Okay, so coming on to today's episode, we are going to start off by talking a little bit about staff work zones and a bit more about staff management. So I have actually just swapped out our little small staff room for the large staff room, which you can research through the mechanic research here. So. It is in staff facilities. If you click on this, you can see you get the large staff room on the second level there. So I have just researched that and swapped that out. And what that means, it will hold more staff members in it. So because we have now got two information booths, four food and drink stands here, we've got the mechanic, the vet, and all kinds of other people floating around here as well. I thought we needed a larger staff room in order to house them all when they're on their breaks. So let's have a little talk about staff work zones. Oh, and our mechanic has finished some research there. So let's move a Joan onto something else. I'm going to name all the staff in the next episode as well. Got some good ideas for some names there. Oh my goodness, I've just seen Eyeloss is about to die of old age. Gosh, that ring's true, <laughs> doesn't it? Sorry, Egg. <laughs> oh no, we're going to lose another Blacktail Prairie dog. So we'll need to have a little look as well, actually, in terms of contraception and whether we need to change any of that but let's for now put this one onto another theme i think we'll go for the classic theme and let's get all of our props and our building materials from the classic theme researched okay oh oh ilos has died that's it news just in ilos is dead <laughs> oh no should we have a second plaque i feel like we should I feel like we should. Let's do it. Let's create a little memorial for Ilos as well. And we'll just put it on this stone wall right there. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. Okay, let's have a look at our Blacktail Prairie dogs then before we come onto the staff work zone. So who have we got here? Now, yes, Ilos has died. Now, if, if we click on her as well, we can say call the vet because you will see... Oh goodness, that's so sad. This game can be absolutely horrific. I'm going to call the vet so the vet urgently takes that away because guests do not want to be looking that, at that and I don't really either. So, Okay, so back to the original thing I wanted to talk about in this episode, which was staff management and work zones. And you will notice I have swapped out the small staff room for this large staff room here, which can be researched by the mechanics. So we've got that done. And I really, I just did that because we've got two information booths here, four food shops. Lots more staff milling around. We've got security guards now in. So we wanted to make sure that we've got enough room for them to rest and to take their breaks. These large staff rooms can hold more staff than the smaller ones. So yeah, a bit more efficient really. And the design that I want to put on this little staff area as well lends itself to this really nicely. You'll see it mirrors these buildings over this side. So if we come into Zoo and then we come into the staff tab here, you'll see there is actually a staff room tab within this menu. And you can see our staff rooms here. So obviously we've got one in the back of the Lima house. You can rename them. So let's call that one Lima house staff room. We'll call that one the entrance staff room. 
Now within them, you can see who's in them if you drop down. In fact, we've got no one in them at the moment, but you can see also the capacity there. So this one holds three times the amount of the smaller staff room. So that's good to know. Here as well, you can add perks to them, which is really useful. So you've got things like staff healthcare, so they'll be more resilient against being overworked. We've got social club to gain happiness faster, and this will help bring their training date forward with learning resources as well. So what I'm actually going to do on the top one is do staff healthcare. So we go back to our staff. Our keepers are pretty overworked, our caretakers are pretty overworked, and so are our vendors. And that is because they do need training. <laughs> so let's go ahead and actually train up some of our vendors here. In fact, we'll train all of them because we're breaking it in. <laughs> We've got enough money to do that. But obviously, bear in mind when you train them, their salaries are going to go up. So it is going to cost you quite a lot more when it comes to things like mechanics and the more expensive staff members, your bets and stuff like that. So let's just train up one of our bets for now. We'll train up all three of our keepers and we'll train up Bob. Let's make him a head mechanic. <laughs> He's a little bit overworked as well. So yeah, what I am going to do is put staff healthcare on the entrance staff room and then on the Lima house, I think I might do social club actually so they can gain happiness a little bit faster. So yeah, that's a really useful thing to note in here and do keep an eye on their happiness. Um, some staff will want to be trained and they might get unhappy if they're not being trained and that sort of thing. So you do need to keep your eye on that and upgrade people accordingly. I think I'll upgrade both of our caretakers as well. They're on the cheaper end, so that's not too much bother to do. And I thought we had hired security guards, but we obviously haven't. So let's go ahead and do that now as well. So we'll just drop one in there. Quick escape. So we don't hire two by mistake. And then, yeah, we can let him wander. So when it comes to work zones, here you can see your list of work zones when you've set them up here. Your various vendor shops, undersigned staff, which is all of them at the moment. <laughs> So this is what we are going to set up now. So in order to do that, we're going to click new work zone and then we're going to highlight the buildings that we want included in it. Now, if staff are not in a work zone, they will literally move all around the whole park. So if these vendors aren't assigned a work zone, they could go to this staff room over here. Your keepers, etc., might decide that they're going to come to the staff room over here and waste time walking over there for their break. So that's why really we want to set them up. And we also want to keep keepers focused on their habitats. That's the main reason that I use them, especially early on in the game like this. So what I am going to do is set up a staff work zone that includes the lemur habitat, the black prairie dogs and the staff facilities we have over here. So in order to do that, we just click on various different habitats we want to add and you'll see they turn green because they are in this staff work zone. Now for the keepers, they do want a staff room and they also want a keeper hut. So we need to keep that in mind. So I've added this keeper hut in there too. Now I've got toilets and an information booth here. The electrics only need to be maintained by the mechanic, so we don't need to worry about that. So that is all that we need in our keeper work zone. And then of course we are going to give this a name. If we just click edit there, we can change the name of it. So I'm going to call it Lemurs and BTPD, <laughs> Blacktail Prairie Dogs. And so we're going to have two keepers assigned to this and they're both going to be operating between these two habitats. You can, if you want to be super picky, it's set up two, so one for each. So you've just got one keeper assigned to the black tail prairie dogs and one to the lemurs. And that will make sure that you're always getting you know, lots of attention to your animals. That's kind of how I generally like to do it. But having two like this is not a problem. I don't tend to go more than three to one keeper at least. And they better be three kind of light maintenance animals realistically for that. If you've got a big safari park, your keeper is not going to want to be stretched across multiple different zones and habitats. So you need to keep that in mind. So once we're done, we'll click, click exit up there and you can see we've got two habitats, one building, one staff room in there. Now in order to assign our staff, we'll come back to the keepers. So let's choose two of these. And there is two ways of doing this. So now that we've selected multiples, we can just come down the bottom here and we can say lemurs and blacktail prairie dogs and they will both change. Or else we could just select one and, and choose the whatever work zone you want individually. So then I'm going to go back in and set up another work zone and that is going to be for the nine monitors down here and we're going to choose the staff room and the keeper hut which I'm going to guess is that one which it is we can see from there and then we'll just edit the name of this and we'll call this nine monitors. We'll click escape at the top there to make sure that it is saved nicely. We'll go back to our staff and we'll put this unassigned keeper onto the nine monitors that just to make sure that we're getting lots of attention to all of our animals and staff aren't kind of drifting around the park, going to staff rooms too far away, not paying attention, like you might end up with all three on these two habitats and no one looking after the nine monitors. That's really how I like to do it. 
We are not going to assign the vets for now. The vets need to move around. They need access to the vet research facility, quarantine, veterinary surgery. We've only got one of those in the main entrance, so it makes sense to just let them wander. Same with our mechanics. We don't have a big enough park yet to worry about staff work zones for everyone else. But with the vendors, because we have got quite a few now, I think we are going to broaden this out a little bit. So let's create a new zone and we're going to just click and drag across the map. And then we could select all of those at once. We'll choose this staff room for them. And we're going to call this entrance shops. And we'll click enter on there and exit. And then I'm going to do another staff work zone, which is the information booth and this little staff room over here. And we're going to call that Lima Info Booth. That'll do for now. So now I'm just going to check which staff member is actually at this unit. And that is Deborah Vera. This is Information Centre 3. So she's actually not assigned to it, which is, <laughs> which is interesting, but she's there already. So we're going to put her on Lima Information Booth. And then we're going to select absolutely everyone else. We should have our four shops and two yeah information booths and we're going to select entrance shops and i have just realized a fatal error so let's go back into our work zones we're going to go to the entrance shops edit work zone and i also want to include our two information booths there so again i'm just going to click and drag and that will add them again the color coding you can see this staff room is now blue because it's in this work zone and another and then you can see which buildings are not in particular work zones or in a different work zone etc with the color coding there so now entrance shops, yeah, we've got six buildings, one staff room, and then we do have six of our staff members located onto that. So what I am also going to do is hire one vendor who is going to be free roaming. And they, the reason for that is now that we've got seven shops in total, what they will do is run between the two different zones and essentially fill people's breaks when they're off. So that'll be quite useful for us. We can see already Geneva here is very tired and needs a staff room. So hopefully Grover can go in and fill their place in their shop whilst they are on a break. So that's the kind of general idea of that. And that's how you manage your staff work zones. And later on as the series progresses, we may start to add vets and mechanics and such like to the different areas of the park as it kind of gets larger. But at the moment, it's small enough that it will just keep pretty well managed and maintained just with staff being able to free roam around. Okay, so let's come on to our habitat for today and we are going to be putting in the African penguins. Now you may remember back to our zoo plan. I'll put it on screen now. And you can see here are the African penguins. And what I would like to do with this area is to create a really nice sloped path going down into an underwater viewing area, which is going to kind of be the centre point of this aquatic area that we'll be putting in this side. So we'll have penguins, otters, maybe beavers and seals in here for certain. And all of them I'd like to have this underwater viewing area. Now, in order to get really smooth paths down into this area, what we do want to do is use the terrain stack tool. So let's take a little look at that. Now, just before I do that, I'm going to bring out my main path that I want down here that you'll have seen in that zoo plan. Uh, we're going to keep this to a width of eight metres as we have done around the rest of the zoo. And I want to make sure that I'm leaving enough space for my train line to cross over here. So we'll do it slightly further out. We'll do it about here and we'll start bringing it out this way. And in fact, you know what? We're going to use the Z trick for this so we get a really nice angle on it. And we're going to bring it out at almost a right angle and bring it across like this. Then we're going to start curving it round just a little bit so we can bring it in around our Nialas, which will eventually go here behind the staff work zone too. So we'll just follow it round like that for now. Okay, so terrain stamp tool, which is this second button down in your terrain menu here. Now, the way this operates is you'll see it's a shape. Now, you can hold shift and lift it up and obviously down as well if you wanted to. So it's literally like acts like a cube. You can change the dimensions of it here. If we wanted it higher, we could just raise that up. And yeah, it's this massive cube. So we could literally put something in the landscape like this <laughs> if we wanted to. I'm not doing that here. But of course here, what we want is to actually dig out into the ground. So I'm going to change this to subtract terrain. And what I do want is a height of 10 meters, I think at least. So if we press shift, you can see this is kind of going down into the ground. It would just literally carve a massive cube into the ground if you did it that way. But what I'm looking for is 10 meters from the surface. So you see holding shift here, it kind of snaps up to a point where the, the roof of it is essentially open. 
and that means it's in line with the surface top here now you can see we can continue up and it's going to get shorter but i do want to make sure that this is 12 meters i'm going to do it literally just as it pops up like that so now i know that that is a 12 meter pit here so that we're going to have super nice deep water for our penguin habitat so that's going to be the right height for me i'm then going to come back into sculpting and i'm going to use flattened foundation we'll make this a little bit larger make sure it's on 100 percent now I'm just going to carve out a large area here, which is going to form like the base of where our path and our underwater viewing area is going to sit. And this is going to be super, super rough for the moment because we're going to do more sculpting about how we want the habitat and the terrain to look in just a second. But for now, this is what we're going to do because we want to get the base of our path in and get our path down. Before we start putting in any habitat barriers, I would add for this area. Which reminds me, we do want to put our mechanic back on to barrier research because what I would really, really like to get to is this thick glass. So we do need to do a few more levels before we get there, which makes really nice underwater viewing barriers. Okay, so I'm going to carve this almost right back to where this path sits. We'll bring it a little bit further forward than that. Now you can see as well with this terrain, it's kind of carved it out because we are quite deep down here. If you wanted to pull that back out, just go to the pull tool and if you click on the side like this, it's going to pull it out towards you. So it's going to be whatever direction it is. So you can get rid of some of those caves by doing that and then using a little bit of smooth to kind of make it a little bit nicer if, if you want to get rid of any of those sections. So that's another little trick with the terrain tools there. But what we do want to do, like I said, is bring down a really smooth path here. Now there's a number of ways that you could do that. So we could, for example, just take our path out like this hold shift or also click J on the keyboard, U to raise, J to go down. And we could bring it down like so and then flatten it on the ground. That's absolutely fine. But what happens if you want it to be on the terrain and not a raised piece of path? So let's just undo that. How we're going to need to do that is use the terrain stamp tool to make it super smooth. Now I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. And of course we can bring it back in afterwards if we need to. Let's go to the terrain stamp tool. Now, this time I'm going to do add terrain. And yeah, I probably want a height of 10 meters again. I'm going to use shift to move it up a little bit here. And we're going to make sure that this yellow box is aligned nicely to that surface. So you can see if you're slightly too high, you'll see those lines are kind of edging up. So we just want it sitting nicely on the surface like that. And you'll find that point fairly easy to see, I think. Now again, with Z, I'm just going to move this around. So this operates the same way as any construction building, because what I'd like is the path to slope down this way. And then we have got a width of 12. I'm going to narrow that a tiny bit. We'll do 11, I think, for this, which should be... Actually, no, we'll keep it on 12, because the wider the better, and then we can detail in around it. So we'll do that. And then what I'm going to do is hit X, and you'll notice this now operates in exactly the same way as any building element does. So we hit X again, and we've now got this rotate function. So what I am going to do, and I'm not going to put this on angle snap because 15 degrees is frankly a little bit too much for this. I'm going to just snap this down just to a nice kind of smooth, what I feel is a, a smooth enough gradient for people to be walking down this slope. I'd maybe go a little bit harsher than that. Something like that. Then if we hit X again and just drag this back down with the arrow again, what we want to do is make sure that this is aligning to the surface as nicely as possible. We quite often have to use a little bit of smooth tool to help with the top of the terrain here but this should be okay and we can just drag it across as well if we need to there with something like that so that's the direction that our path's going to come down to i'm going to click tick and then what i'm going to do is just with the blue arrow i'm not going to adjust anything else i'm just going to keep moving this along making sure that i'm not going too far or leaving any kind of bumpy craziness in that grid we want to make sure it's overlapping so ideally a little bit of yellow there will help with that i'm going to shift it along like so keep going until we hit the ground like that and then we'll see at the top it's not it's not too bad there i think it's okay so let's get our path and try it out now i'm thinking i'll probably do a different path i think for this area We'll keep it as a width of eight so it's nice and wide. And then let's just bring it nicely down this slope. And it's maybe a little bit bumpy at the end there. We could possibly smooth that bit out a bit. So let's just bring that back a tiny, tiny bit. Like, we'll bring it back to there. 
Let's go back into our terrain tools and we'll just grab smooth. I'm just going to smooth that out a little, little bit and see if that helps. Let's keep our angle snap on for this so we can bring it down nicely like so. And yeah, that's a little bit less jarring on the bottom there. It's a reasonably steep slope, but what we're going to do is actually cover it in a bit of a cave. And this will come down here into a nice underwater viewing area. So what I would like to do here as well for the penguins, let's go back to terrain and just widen out our deep water area, our underwater area. And we'll come back into paths. So I'm going to create a little viewing area inside the penguin habitat like this. And we're going to align to grid and then I'm going to create a nice gridded area. We'll just right click on that corner and get that in nice and square. So in here, what they'll be able to do is kind of come in and look all around at the penguin swimming. That is the general idea of this. I'm just going to keep the path on going out that way. And we're going to deselect grid and we can bend it around a little bit because I want it to come out this way for the design of how this area is going to sit. But this is going to be yeah, a really nice underwater viewing area for our penguins, which is going to sit right about here. So that's really how to design that and use those terrain tools to get a really nice smooth sloped path down your hill. Because if you do just use the smooth function, like honestly, it's impossible to get it smooth like that. You'll have lumps and bumps everywhere and it looks a little bit ridiculous. And then from here, of course, you can start, you know, bringing out the terrain. Now that we've got the path in, the path won't affect it. So if we wanted to do smooth here, we could start smoothing this out or flatten to foundation. We can bring this path across. And then use a bit of smooth to, to get rid of that harsh edge if we wanted to like this. And it doesn't matter if it's slightly more bumpy because we can cover that up with some natural, nice detailing there. But we've got our path in nice and smooth and that is the main thing. Of course, now that we've done that, we want to get rid of the long grass. <laughs> it's not sticking through the path there. OK, so I am now going to go into a time lapse to create our penguin habitat. And I'll do a little bit of voiceover so I can explain what I'm doing throughout it. Okay, so we're just starting off by putting in the viewing platform, which is going to overlook the main penguin habitat here. And the reason why I'm doing this is I want to get all paths and networks in before we get the water in, because water can behave a little bit differently and sometimes make it tricky to put paths and barriers in afterwards and then get the water back in how you like. So we're doing all of this first. And you'll see the paths were a little bit finicky trying to get my nice curved corner in there. So I gave up and, and redid the angle of the platform. And here now, I wasn't happy with how I'd originally laid down this path. I wanted it kind of curving in. So once I put the platform in, I could see there wasn't quite enough space for what exactly I wanted to do here. So we're just using the X function on the terrain stamp tool there just to angle it in a curve. So we keep that really nice smooth slope, but we can do it in a curved shape like that. And then going ahead using our grid function to put in a little underwater viewing area. Now, because there is a lot of water in this particular habitat, I'm then getting the barriers in to make sure we're all watertight around where the guests will be viewing. Don't want them flooded out around here. And what we will be doing with this area is making it into a bit of a cave, which will extend round where the otter habitat and other underwater animal habitats will be. But we'll come to that in a second. Don't forget with the barriers you can just remove any of the posts that you don't want and then make the barriers a little bit longer which is exactly what i did around the viewing platform there we don't have those posts in the middle of the guest viewing area and here down the side i'm just adding in again a nice relatively smooth slope which we can use as a staff path entrance which will all be kind of hidden at the back of the habitat this side Thank you. 
And now we're going to start making our cave. So again, we're using terrain stamp here, but we're going to use a floating additional terrain stamp and we're just creating the roof to our area. So essentially what we're doing is making this little underground cave entrance into the various different viewing platforms for the underwater aquatic area here. Then we'll just use the push and pull function within the terrain tools just to kind of shape it out a little bit nicer so it's got less harsh square edges and feels a bit more natural. So now again, before we put the water in, I do want to shape out how I want the habitat water area to look. And for some smaller animals, they do need nice slopes down into the water. So do remember to do that. And here I'm creating an arch for them to swim through underwater. But with these arches, you'll see I put a little wall piece in. And that's because in order for them to swim through it, it does need to be four by four at least. So I just use a little wall piece, which I later delete to measure that out and make sure they can actually swim through the little arch. And these underwater areas just take a lot of like playing around with honestly to get them how you want it's very difficult to envisage sometimes without the water so don't be afraid to put the water in and remove it until you've got the shape that you like and i find using lots of kind of gentle push pull actions will help make it feel a bit more natural you'll get some nicer kind of shapes interesting shapes for your viewing guests there as well Once we're happy with the underwater area what i do want to do is add in the penguins just to check the size of the habitat and you, you'll see here of course i've gone absolutely way overboard with this now the only th consideration with this is african penguins breed like wildfire and they are one of the best animals you can possibly use in the game to get conservation credits because if you release the babies to the wild that you get a couple of hundred over a hundred at least for each penguin even if they're not super high star rated so it's a great, great way to sort of breed them and get conservation credits. And you can literally have hundreds of them in one habitat and they're, they're more than happy. So I'm just making sure this is large enough and we've got enough space to accommodate lots and lots of penguins. And then of course, we'll just go through all of their habitat requirements and make sure that they are happy with the terrain type and style. And then we'll start putting in plants and rock detailing after. But first off, I'm going to put in a little shelter for them. So I'm just using some of the aquatic wall pieces here, actually, which you can make any colour you want to create a nice little indoor shelter. And this building will incorporate the staff entrance as well. I move around all the barriers later, do not worry. And we make them into null barriers as well, rather than having the glass there. I just use that for measurement purposes to begin with, because it's very easy to upgrade. And the plan with this little back area is to have a keeper's hut in here as well so it's super nice and close for the keepers for when they're looking after the animals to get everything that they need. Sometimes with these floor pieces, I wanted to put in a concrete floor here. I had to break it away from the group to get it exactly at the height that I wanted. So they can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but just keep playing with them and playing with the terrain until you get the height that you want.
It was super difficult to get this keeper's hut in here and all I needed to do was move the barriers back and that helped. <laughs> so don't forget that if you're trying to get that in, just move them away and then move your null barriers up nice and close and you'll get that in there nicely. I did later come in with a bit more detailing in this building as well to add some ni nice little drain effects to the floor which is a really good touch and some lights as well which I hadn't put in here. I've added in an underwater feeder we can press play because the animals have got food and water and shelter that they need and now we can start adding the rock and foliage detailing into it and really bringing the habitat alive so yeah in the two back corners I wanted to do these little cave areas which guests could see in from the viewing platform but nice little sort of more private outdoor sleeping areas for those penguins with a bit of bedding inside and the such like I did come back later and fix this cave up because I wasn't happy with how the bedding was sitting on the ground there because it wasn't super flat so later on you will see me reorganize this cave a little bit and make it a lot nicer. And of course you don't want to forget to add your enrichment items in as well. I've already set the bet up at this point to research the penguins so that we get more enrichment items for them which is one of the first things you should do once you get your animals into your zoo. And I definitely didn't want to have the glass barriers all the way around this habitat so we are just using rocks here to kind of fill in over where the glass barriers sit and we'll change these all up to null barriers later on. You can see here the guests are all kind of piling up on the path to watch the penguins which is not what we want. We want them to use the viewing platform or the underwater viewing area so by putting in these rocks this will block the view and discourage them from doing that. You do sometimes get some odd guests who think they can see three rocks and trees but <laughs> 
It's one of the quirks of the game. Obviously where we've put the rocks over this glass barrier here with the path sloping down into the underwater viewing area. We cannot change that barrier to null because obviously the water will spill through so please don't try and do that. Now we've got the edge of the habitat all set up we're going to concentrate on the internal elements putting in more enrichment items now that we've unlocked them through the research and lots more rock detailing for this one because they are african penguins their habitat is very kind of tropical and sandy so they don't want many plants if you're in franchise mode obviously you're in sandbox you can get rid of that option and put as many plants in as you want but it does mean the habitats end up relatively plain so an awful lot of rocks is needed to really bring it to life With the feeding trays I quite like to sort of hide them a little bit with the rocks or at least give them a bit of a platform to sit on so they don't look quite so stark in the habitat so that's what you'll see me doing here. And with the aquatic pack as well it is just one of the best packs absolutely in terms of the rocks that come with it. You get these little stairs and, and all of the standard aquatic pack rocks that you'll see at the top of the screen in the options menu are colour changeable so you can change them to match the theme of the rocks that you're using which is what I've done here to match those tropical rocks. And penguins are not particularly good at jumping or climbing so checking that they can access all of the areas is super important and they will be able to use the little stairs that come with the aquatic pack so it's great to use those to get them onto platforms if you put them around your habitat. And the piles of rocks that come with the aquatic pack there's a smaller version and a much larger version they are really really useful for bringing a bit of realism to your habitat so you'll see me placing them all over this habitat to try and like kind of give a bit of interest just like all that boring sand and soil color that we have around and it really makes it pop alive i think and makes some of the features and the harsh rock walls stand out a little bit less when we add these in I originally went around and did all of them in the tropical rock colour and then actually you'll see me later on come in with some of the just bog standard vanilla colour because it's quite sandy 
and mix those in with the tropical coloured rocks and I think that gave a nicer effect because I wasn't really quite happy with how this looked against the sand, very dark rock against all of the sand colour. So having that blend of different rock colours really helps I think to bring it alive a little bit more. And as mentioned, they do have a really small foliage requirement, so you cannot go overboard too much with trees. And because the main feature of this habitat is the underwater cave viewing area, I spent a lot of the coverage allowance on doing some reeds and grasses underwater to really make that come alive and focusing less on the above ground element of this habitat. There's just a few trees and bushes you'll see here. And I did actually go over the coverage allowance, which is fine as long as you're monitoring your penguin's happiness and they've got enough enrichment items and everything else that they need in their habitat. You can extend over it just a little bit, so don't be afraid to do that. And don't forget to use your Q and E keys to go up and down so you get a better view underwater. It can be really tricky to navigate your way around these habitats once they're in. So do remember to use those and you'll get a better view that way. as well as the grasses I've placed an absolute ton of these aquatic rocks under the water because I really like you'll see the finished product in a second but it really does help to bring it alive and rough up that surface which can look quite plain and boring especially when you've got quite a large underwater area like this habitat. The so copying and pasting big sections of these rocks really helps to speed up that process because they're quite small in general.
now we do just want to hide away that staff path access down into the underwater area here because it's not very nice here, the staff paths, I don't think. But we'll be coming back to do more detailing in the underwater area as we put in more habitats down here. So the final piece of the puzzle was to build out the viewing platform area and I decided to use these conservation pack wood pieces, the slatted wood pieces here, create a really interesting shaded roof for them. So it's not a solid roof, it's very open but provides a bit of shade for the guests underneath. And I feel like with the wood it kind of goes with the sand colour of the habitat and also the African element of the African penguins as well. With the, you'll notice this wood wall that I'm going to put in underneath the platform to shelter and hide away the bottom of it in a second, which I felt like had a sort of African-ish vibe to it, using lots of different coloured pieces of wood.
Okay, so there we go. And you won't have seen me actually do this little front entrance here. I've just added in a couple of penguin statues and our usual little rock edge path detailing and some bushes and, and things like that around here with the African penguin sign. Really love how the shelters come together. Those conservation pieces are really, really nice to put into a roof pattern like this with those supporting beams. I think it's come together pretty nicely indeed. They get some really nice views out onto the penguins from this side. So that cave actually in the background is pretty hidden, unless you stand right back here. That's a little bit private for the penguins, but you can see across down into this one. And of course we've got ooh, both of the feeding platforms right next to this right here and here. So lots of good views, I think, of the penguins from this little area. And it definitely sort of blends in with the sandy colour, I think, using these different wood plank pieces here. Well, they seem to be having a lot of fun. <laughs> We've got a penguin swimming in, having fun in the water over here. And of course the shelter as well has come together pretty nicely. If we just go inside, you'll see I did add in these grates, these yeah, sort of kind of drainage grates along the floor here, which I thought added a nice effect. Little penguin having a nap. Hello. <laughs> um but yeah, all in all I think it's working nice. If we go into water as well, we can see it's just a it's an absolutely massive habitat and they are using the archway really nicely. The view from the underwater viewing area here as well is really quite nice. I've made sure the water was a bit more transparent so they could see nice and clearly through it and change the colour a little bit to give it more of a tropical vibe. I think it's come out nicely and I really like the use of these rust poles on the little jetty pieces here. I think that adds a little bit of extra realism because it really is quite all in all quite a plain habitat for these animals because they just don't like all of the foliage <laughs> and this is already over their limit but like i said they're still happy because they've got enough of everything else that they want and we've still got lots more detailing to do around the underwater area as we add in the other animals but next time out we will of course be building another animal habitat and we'll be going over education talk points as well, because I'd really like to put one in the African penguin habitat here. But that is going to be all for today. So if you have enjoyed the video, likes, comments and shares are really, really appreciated. Do let me know your name suggestions for these penguins in the comments below and we'll give them a name next time. And if you are interested in picking up that aquatic pack that I've used very readily in this particular habitat, do please consider checking out my instant gaming link in the description. But that is all from me for today, so thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you again next time. Bye-bye!